Hello and welcome to this week's edition of 50 Years Serving the Island, a series of programmes showcasing highlights from Manx Radio's archives during the station's first five decades serving the public in the Isle of Man. In 1968, Manx Radio was transferred into public ownership to become the island's public service broadcaster. On Timwall Day, we brought you part one of a special programme broadcast on New Year's Eve 1979. A review of our Millennium Year, presented by Ian Cannell, and featuring a look back at a number of events that took place across the Isle of Man as we celebrated 1,000 years of Timwald. This morning we bring you part two of the programme, which begins at St John's on Timwald Day, with Her Majesty the Queen presiding over the ceremony. Freemen of man, in your ancient Timwald assembled, I call upon you as an expression of your loyalty to give three cheers to Her Majesty the Queen. Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Has Your Majesty any further commands? If any persons wish to present a petition for redress, let them now come forward. The ancient right of free men of man to petition the Lord at Tinwald, the highest court in the land. Well, Millennium Year produced a record number of petitions covering subjects ranging from pollution by nuclear waste from Windscale Power Station to the future of the birch as a form of corporal punishment. All would receive the same consideration. In accordance with Standing Order 140, I shall refer these petitions to the Standing Orders Committee of Tinwald, who will report on them at their earliest convenience. Tinwald will adjourn to the church and complete such business as remains to be transacted. The captioning ceremony in the church is not seen by members of the general public. This is when the new acts are captioned or signed as proof that they have been proclaimed from Tinwald Hill. Your Excellency, members of the Council, Mr. Speaker and members of the House of Keys, we shall now caption the acts just promulgated on Tinwald Hill. Now Her Majesty the Queen is appending a signature to the first of the acts, which she hands to His Excellency the Lieutenant Governor. and she will have 18 of these documents to sign. By custom, those acts are signed using quill pens, the Queen's signature being followed by that of the Speaker of the House of Keys, captioning on behalf of the House of Keys. Your Excellency, members of the Council, Mr Speaker and members of the Keys, that concludes the business of the Court. The Court will now stand adjourned to Tuesday the 10th of July 1979 at 10.30am in Douglas. The Council will now retire and members of the House of Keys will remain to transact such business as may be brought before them. And that turned out to be the last Tinwald ceremony as first Deemster for His Honour Deemster Roy Eason promulgating the laws in Manx. Later in the year he announced his retirement to be effective in January 1980. Well, after the Tinwald ceremony, the Queen went on to Government House for avocado pears, poached salmon and strawberries. Then in the afternoon, she travelled west again, this time to Peel, where the new secondary school was to be given the distinction of being the only school on the island to be opened by a reigning monarch. The name, Queen Elizabeth School, had its critics, but nevertheless there were large crowds outside it on the Douglas Road as Her Majesty the Queen arrived. fanfare is played so the royal carriage comes into the forecourt I can see the grey horses now 
going past the main entrance doorway the carriage comes to a halt the door is opened and uh, Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh now in morning dress have arrived at Peel School Her Majesty is received by His Excellency the Lieutenant Governor Sir John Paul who is presenting Mrs. Betty Hanson the Chairman of the Isle of Man Board of Education she of course is also chairman of the uh, Isle of Man Government Millennium Committee so she has uh, certainly a lot of responsibility on this day in a thousand years for the Isle of Man. She is now presenting Mr. T. L. Ellis, the chairman of the Secondary and Further Education Committee of the Board of Education, the Director of Education Mr. Alan Davis and his deputy Mr. G. A. Baker, the headmaster of the school Mr. Bob Foster and representatives of the contractors Pochin Isle of Man Limited and the architect Mr. Anthony Snow who will uh, present the ceremonial key to uh, Her Majesty who will then open the main door of the building the key is proffered to Her Majesty who accepts it and is now about to open the door and to enter the school the door opens and Her Majesty the Queen walks into Peel Secondary School accompanied by Mrs. Betty Hanson, the Chairman of the Isle of Man Board of Education. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highness, Your Excellency, Lady Paul, my Lord Bishop, Mr. Speaker, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. In welcoming Your Majesty to this school, I express the greatest possible joy and honour that the Board of Education and the people of the island feel about your presence here this afternoon. There has been a long-standing tradition in the west of the island for education, and in many ways this area has, over the centuries, been the vanguard of educational development in the Isle of Man. It is most fitting, therefore, that this beautiful school should find its home in Peel. Your Majesty will be aware of the great affection which the people here have for you and your family, and I find it difficult to express in words our gratitude for the honour which you are bestowing on us today. Your Majesty, may I humbly ask you to unveil the plaque which commemorates this historical event. Now Her Majesty the Queen is moving across, accompanied by Mrs. Hanson, and she pulls the cord which reveals the commemorative plaque. The photographs are taken, and Her Majesty returns to her seat. Then a choir of primary school children from all parts of the island, conducted by Alan Pickard, sang two Manx songs, including the spinning wheel song. At the end of the opening ceremony, the future pupils of the new Queen Elizabeth School gave the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh a rousing send-off on their way to join about 1,500 guests from all walks of island life at a royal garden party in the school grounds. Well, the summer season continued through July, 
as everyone wondered what effect, if any, the millennium would have on the arrivals of tourists. There seemed to be almost as many opinions as there were people to express them, but as the season wore on it seemed that, even though we may not have had the best of weather, we did have a pretty good tourist season. Eventually the figures confirmed it, a total increase of about 10% on 1978. Not much, howled the critics, what about the million visitors? It's very good, replied the Millennium's supporters. All the other UK resorts are reporting substantial decreases. We have an increase and something has brought them here. Well, no doubt something did, but short of an individual canvas, it's largely speculation depending on your point of view. When the visitors got here, there was plenty going on for them to see, and in the evenings, a number of special concerts at the Gaiety Theatre, featuring international artists of the calibre of Mary O'Hara. Of course, the island is proud of its homegrown performers too, and a packed house in St. German's Church in Peel, soon to be the island's cathedral church, testified to the interest in a return visit by international soprano Margaret Curphy. Together with her husband, Philip Summerscales, organist Stephen Barlow, and the Curphy-inspired Glen Faber Ladies Choir and Country Singers, they made their own magnificent contribution to the special events of Millennium Year. It seemed that despite the criticism that Millennium Year merely gave the politicians an opportunity to hobnob with royalty and to grow fat at the taxpayers' expense, there were indeed many special attractions that anyone could enjoy, and often for free. For example, many public buildings were specially floodlit during the summer season, and more than one person expressed the view to me that the most worthwhile feature of Millennium Year was the spectacular floodlighting of St. John's Church. And how often in 1979 could you see such a unique fleet of proud sailing ships as we saw at the Millennium Sail Training Association rally at the beginning of August? Yachts came from all over the world and were reviewed by His Majesty the King of Norway who sailed here in his own royal yacht and stayed a week. In contrast, the north of the island revived the traditional cultural festival in Krunjecht, with the result that its future seems assured as an annual event hopefully until the next millennium. And so the summer wore on, and the Manx Grand Prix Race Week, traditionally one of the last major tourist events, was soon with us. This year it was a royal occasion too, as despite the recent assassination of Earl Mountbatten, their Royal Highnesses Prince and Princess Michael of Kent kept their promise to attend the races. The Prince, a keen motorcyclist, had expressed a wish to ride around the course, and had indeed proved his point by bringing his own crash helmet to the island with him. The extrovert princess had keen misgivings about the wisdom of this, particularly when she saw the competitors hurtling past the grandstand. Holding the prince's hand, she implored, Surely you're not going to do that! Never mind, said enthusiastic race officials, you can see what he gets up to, because we'd like to offer you a seat in the road's open car that follows him. Well, she went, confessed afterwards to having enjoyed her trip immensely, and so did the spectators who watched them. And uh, I think now, just about any second, the uh, occasion that we've all been waiting for, as I look up, up towards the paddock, I can see the machines coming out onto the circuit, and this will mean that His Royal Highness Prince Michael of Kent is about to make history by being the first royal person to actually travel on the TT course on closed roads, and I'm sure you want to give him a great send-off. His Royal Highness away for a lap, of the TT circuit and wonderful applause indeed as number 103 just finishes and His Royal Highness off now for this 37 and three quarter mile lap and spectators around the course I'm sure are going to give him just as big a welcome as indeed the crowd did here. Peter Neal describing the start of the royal lap and at the prize presentation that night Prince Michael received the surprise award of a replica of the race trophy for the fastest ever royal lap. And for the record, we also had local victories in the races, as Dave Raybon and Roger Luckman both won newcomers' races and the Manx National Anthem rang round the garlanding ceremonies. And there was another in the International Millennium Air Rally held in September. The RAF Red Arrows aerobatic display team was followed by an airborne Formula One Grand Prix, tiny aeroplanes flying at 200 miles per hour just a few feet above the ground, all stirring stuff. The winner was one Flight Lieutenant Brian Skillicorn, and immediately everyone wondered, could he be one of the Onken Skillicorns? 
Well, indeed he was, and another Manx victory was chalked up. September's attractions continued with the International Trophy Car Rally, where the Scandinavian challenge faded and Russell Brooks brought his Ford Escort home first. Sadly, the local challenge came to grief on the very last stage, when Ian Corkill and Eunice Dale crashed their Escort at Ingebrek and so lost a leaderboard place. But there was still the Longton Motor Club hill climb from Hilbury to Keppel Gate, and entering into the spirit of Millennium Year, the Preston-based organisers wondered what special feature they could introduce. The answer was a direct challenge between a car and a motorcycle. The racing car to be driven by Formula 5000 star Brian Redman and the motorcycle by former world champion and TT winner Phil Reed. For the record, the car won. And then, all of a sudden, it seemed that millennium year was fizzling out. The last of the visitors went home, the arrivals figures were published and people started thinking about 1980. You're listening to 50 Years Serving the Island, a series of programmes showcasing highlights from Manx Radio's archives during the station's first five decades serving the public in the Isle of Man. Today we're revisiting the second part of A Review of Millennium Year, presented by Ian Cannell and originally broadcast at the end of 1979. And once the summer season was over, Millennium Year to many local people simply meant the instant lottery. Let no one say that the man in the street didn't participate in the millennium, as even in the tail end of the year we were told of £2,000 per day being spent on the 25 pence tickets. We became a nation of scratchers, as hopeful punters revealed what they hoped would be the magic combination that would produce £500. How many of them, I wonder, gave any thought to the real purpose behind the lottery, to raise funds for the island's elderly and disabled? Chairman of the appeal was Sir John Bolton, unfortunately indisposed on his last day in the legislature. But how did he see the lottery and the appeal generally? His comments were read by his co-trustee, Mr John Klukas. The lottery has been an outstanding success, and the result, I'm sure, exceeds all expectations. The conduct of the lottery and its great success reflect great credit on the finance board and the officials of the Manx Treasury, who have been responsible for organising it and running it from day to day. It has undoubtedly involved a great deal of work. Speaking for the trustees of the Appeal Fund, I must say that the response to the appeal for donations has been disappointing and resulted in something between 11 and 12,000 pounds becoming available to us. However, the proceeds of the lottery have exceeded our wildest expectations and we expect to have a sum of about in the end, £350,000 to carry out our work. And so, after lottery ticket sales ended on Christmas Eve, the jackpot prize to be drawn today stood at £50,765. Miss Isle of Man drew the winning ticket in the Villa Marina this afternoon, watched by David Collister. Well, now the large drum is rolling. The red and yellow colours are going round. 500 weight of tickets are whirling around here on the stage at the Villa Marina for the moment everyone's been waiting for. And now, as they come to a halt, opening the sliding door. Out comes the ticket. It's being handed now to Mr. Radcliffe. The name on the ticket is David Thompson. The address is 9 Brian, B-R-I-E-N. Crescent. Now the next part of it, I'm certain, in my estimation, it doesn't belong to the Alaman. It's uh, B. It's spelt B A L U M A M A L L A R O. Now where does that come from? Island. Ireland. <laughs> yeah. We're so agreed David, on Ireland, David I think. Thompson. Nine Brian Crescent. And there were also ten subsidiary prizes of £1,270 each, six of which came to the island, including two in the same road, Bromet Road in Castletown. Well, Millennium Year started with fireworks, and with fireworks it will end. Tonight, at the centre of the island's heritage, Tinwald Hill at St John's. Has it been a success? Undoubtedly, the publicity for the island, worldwide, has been extensive to say the least. 
That can't be quantified, and neither can the benefits it will produce for the island. But what does the chairman of the Millennium Committee of Tinwald think of it, Mrs. Betty Hansen, MHK? Has it turned out as she expected? Uh, by and large, I think so, but when one does something for the first time, one never knows how certain aspects of it will uh, go. And I would love to do it now with hindsight, of course. I think everyone would like to do that, wouldn't they? But by and large, we have um, accomplished, I think, what we intended to do. And I think the first thing was primarily to make uh, a have a celebration for the people who are living here, make them proud of the, the Isle of Man, proud of their heritage. And the second thing was to let the world know about the Isle of Man, because I'm quite sure even the south of England didn't know about the Isle of Man. And I can honestly say we have accomplished it. I think the world knows about the Isle of Man. And we have uh, got publicity which we could never have afforded to pay for. Mrs. Betty Hansen. And so Millennium Year is over. I suppose we're all left with our own recollections of it, with our own views of what they should or should not have done, our own views about the cost of it, of the likely benefits. Most of us will have our own personal memories of some particular day or an event that we saw or took part in. But I wonder how many of us will have done what Mrs. Marilyn Cannell from Kirk Michael did. She went to the Royal Garden Party at Peel School, and afterwards she gave us this for posterity. The kids have all got a day off, girl, cos today is the 5th of July, and they are holding an especial Tinwald, cos a thousand odd years have gone by. Have you seen that there boat in the harbour? Odin's Raven, they say, is its name. And to show that we are sprung from the Vikings, all the way down from Norway it came. Oh, this wondrous millennium of Tinwald. Such palaver there never was seen. Such great parliamentary ceremony in the presence of Lizzie the Queen. All the hobnobs, the bigwigs and gentry, all officials and secretaries too, got invites to the royal garden party. And the captains of the parishes too. So I trotted straight off to me mother to scrounge me some gloves and a hat. I managed to buy a new dress though, all handbag and shoes, that was that. All the scratching and scraping and bustling to get the Peel school near complete, with their rubbish all bunged in the cupboards and the tarmac still soft to the feet. But inside it is large and impressive. In the library and the new entrance hall were these wonderful floral creations, showing legend and history and all. We sat out there in the quadrangle and waited till we heard a cheer and the clippity clop of the horses and a cry of, Her Majesty's here. Betty Hansen, she give a small spout then, and the Queen oped the plaque that was there. The children sang a couple of Manx songs, and the bishop, he rendered a prayer. And the turf, it was cut with great gusto, and the hunter ends fluttered with bands. And that dance where girls slapped the boys' faces, but the boys really just clapped their hands. Then it's off to the royal garden party, all the flounces and frills that were there. And me mother said, take in a hatpin, else me bonnet would have taken the air. Now the Queen, she was late in her schedule, when at last to the party we went. And the greedy had got there before us, and nor a crumb was there left in the tent. And we all stood around in a U-shape and chatted away to each other. And the Queen started off up at one end, and the Duke wandered slowly round to the they spent quite a while circulating, and they frequently stopped for a chatter. Prince Philip went round with our speaker, who's renowned for his knack of good natter. Or oh, the stamina of that there woman. What a full day in Manxland she spent. And when she took the plane out of the airport, to a banquet in Scotland she went. And now that the big day is over, things will slowly go back as they were. For we Manx got our names on the telly, and our Charlie was given a sir. Marilyn Cannell. 
And now, for this repeat broadcast, we can recall the short ceremony which took place last night at St. John's. It seemed only a very short time since St. John's was thronged with people as Her Majesty the Queen presided over the Tinwell ceremony on a summer day. And last night, many hundreds of people gathered again at St. John's on a cold, crisp night to see the final curtain brought down on Millennium Year. The ceremony began with the arrival of His Excellency the Lieutenant Governor and Lady Paul. And now as St. John's Church chimes at seven o'clock, His Excellency the Lieutenant Governor and Lady Paul have arrived in exactly the same spot in St. John's where they arrived on the 5th of July for the Tinwald ceremony. Lady Paul wearing a long skirt against the uh, cold of the evening and now a great crowd has gathered all around the area of the National War Memorial, lining the wall adjoining the processional pathway, which tonight is floodlit with fairy lights strung between the flagpoles, which on Tinwall Day carry the Manx flag. At one end of that pathway, St. John's Church, bathed in a beautiful yellow light, floodlit right to the top of the spire, and at the other end, Tinwald Hill itself, floodlit and with the Millennium flag still flying from the flagstaff in the centre. Well, after the singing of Manx traditional songs by the assembled people and prayers by the Lord Bishop of Soda and Man, the Millennium flag on the special flagpole behind the War Memorial was symbolically lowered to signify the official end of Millennium Year. <laughs> The band plays Abide With Me and the people gathered around the National War Memorial sing that well-known hymn. So a party of cadets from the Isle of Man Millennium Group of Cadets marches smartly forward and begins to lower the Millennium flag from the flagstaff behind the memorial. Slowly the Millennium flag the scarlet flag bearing the Millennium symbol is lowered down that flagstaff at the end of Millennium Year. To the accompaniment of Revali, the Millennium flag was replaced on the flagpole by the Manx national flag, the characteristic three legs of man. And so Millennium Year was finally over. And as we're reviewing the year's events, his Excellency the Lieutenant Governor, Sir John Paul, is in no doubt which was the outstanding event in his mind. Unquestionably the highlight was the annual Tenwell ceremony. This would have been a memorable occasion in any event. It was made immeasurably more so by the presence of Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. And His Excellency revealed that he had sent a telegram to Her Majesty the Queen expressing the gratitude of the Manx people for the Queen's participation in the Millennium celebrations by exercising her right as Lord of Man to preside at the Tinwald ceremony. His Excellency had received a reply from the Queen in which she spoke of the happy memories she has of her visit in July. The Millennium ended as it began, with fireworks and a beacon bonfire on the hillside behind Tinwald Hill. And I said to one of the staff of the Millennium office, I suppose you'll be out of a job now. Well, not for another month, he said. The government auditors want our help in collating all the information necessary to produce details of the Millennium's finances. Now that should be a very interesting Millennium Year project. You've been listening to the second part of a programme originally broadcast on New Year's Eve 1979, a review of Millennium Year presented by Ian Cannell. And you can hear parts one and two of this program in full by going to manxradio.com slash portal, where you can also hear lots of exclusive content from Manx Radio's first five decades as the Isle of Man's public service broadcaster.